Section six of Oriel or the Elixir of Life by William Harrison Ainsworth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sonia. Chapter five The Meeting Near the Statue. The evening of the third day arrived, and Oriel entered Hyde Park by Stanhope Gate. Glancing at his watch, and finding it wanted nearly three quarters of an hour of the time appointed for his meeting with the mysterious stranger, he struck across the park in the direction of the serpentine river apparently he was now perfectly recovered for his arm was without the support of the sling and he walked with great swiftness but his countenance was deathly pale and his looks were so wild and disordered that the few persons he encountered shrank from him aghast a few minutes rapid walking brought him to the eastern extremity of the serpentine and advancing close to the edge of the embankment he gazed at the waters beneath his feet. "'I would plunge into them if I could find repose,' he murmured. "'But it would avail nothing. I should only add to my sufferings. No, I must continue to endure the weight of a life burdened by crime and remorse till I can find out the means of freeing myself from it. Once I dreaded this unknown danger, but now I seek for it in vain.' The current of his thoughts was here interrupted by the sudden appearance of a dark object on the surface of the water, which he at first took to be a huge fish, with a pair of green fins springing from its back, but after watching it more closely for a few moments, he became convinced that it was a human being, tricked out in some masquerade attire, while the slight struggles which it made proved that life was not entirely extinct. Though the moment before he had contemplated self-destruction, and had only been restrained from the attempt by the certainty of failing in his purpose, instinct prompted him to rescue the perishing creature before him. Without hesitation, therefore, and without tarrying to divest himself of his clothes, he dashed into the water, and, striking out, instantly reached the object of his quest, which still continued to float, and turning it over, for the face was downwards, he perceived it was an old man, of exceedingly small size, habited in a pantomimic garb he also remarked that a rope was twisted round the neck of the unfortunate being making it evident that some violent attempt had been made upon his life without pausing for further investigation he took firm hold of the leathern wings of the dwarf and with his disengaged hand propelled himself towards the shore dragging the other after him the next instant he reached the bank clambered up the low brickwork and placed his burden in safety the noise of the plunge had attracted attention, and several persons now hurried to the spot. On coming up and finding Oriol bending over a water sprite, for such at first sight the dwarf appeared, they could not repress their astonishment. Wholly insensible to the presence of those around him, Oriol endeavoured to recall where he had seen the dwarf before. All at once the recollection flashed upon him, and he cried aloud, "'Why, it is my poor murdered grandfather's attendant!' flapdragon but no no he must be dead ages ago yet the resemblance is singularly striking oriol's exclamations coupled with his wild demeanour surprised the bystanders and they came to the conclusion that he must be a travelling showman who had attempted to drown his dwarf the grotesque impish garb of the latter convincing them that he had been exhibited at a booth they made signs therefore to each other not to let oriol escape and one of them, raising the dwarf's head on his knee, produced a flask and poured some brandy from it down his throat, while others chafed his hands. These efforts were attended with much speedier success than might have been anticipated. After a struggle or two for respiration, the dwarf opened his eyes and gazed at the group around him. "'It must be Flapdragon!' exclaimed Oriol. "'Ah! Who calls me?' cried the dwarf ay rejoined oriol do you not recollect me to be sure exclaimed the dwarf gazing at him fixedly you are and he stopped you have been thrown into the water master flapdragon cried a bystander noticing the cord round the dwarf's throat i have replied the little old man by your governor that is by this person cried another laying hold of oriol by him no said the dwarf i have not seen that gentleman for nearly three centuries 
three centuries my little patriarch said the man who had given him the brandy that's a long time think again it's perfectly true nevertheless replied the dwarf his wits have been washed away by the water said the first speaker give him a drop more brandy not a bit of it rejoined the dwarf my senses were never clearer than at this moment at last we have met he continued addressing auriol and i hope we shall not speedily part again we hold life by the same tie how came you in the desperate condition in which i found you demanded auriol evasively i was thrown into the canal with a stone to my neck like a dog about to be drowned replied the dwarf but as you are aware i am not so easily disposed of again the bystanders exchanged significant looks by whom was the attempt made inquired auriol i don't know the villain's name rejoined the dwarf but he is a very tall dark man and is generally wrapped in a long black cloak <laughs> exclaimed auriol when was it done some nights ago i should fancy replied the dwarf for i've been a terrible long time under water i have only just managed to shake off the stone at this speech there was a titter of incredulity among the bystanders you may laugh but it's true cried the dwarf angrily we must speak of this anon said auriol will you convey him to the nearest tavern he added placing money in the hands of the man who held the dwarf in his arms willingly sir replied the man i'll take him to the life guardsman near the barracks that's the nearest public i'll join him there in an hour replied auriol moving away and as he disappeared the man took up his little burden and bent his steps towards the barracks utterly disregarding the dripping state of his habiliments auriol proceeded quickly to the place of rendezvous arrived there he looked around and not seeing any one flung himself upon a bench at the foot of the gentle eminence on which the gigantic statue of achilles is placed it was becoming rapidly dark and heavy clouds portending speedy rain increased the gloom auriol's thoughts were sombre as the weather and the hour and he fell into a deep fit of abstraction from which he was roused by a hand laid on his shoulder recoiling at the touch he raised his eyes and beheld the stranger leaning over him and gazing at him with a look of diabolical exultation the cloak was thrown partly aside so as to display the tall gaunt figure of its wearer while the large collar of sable fur with which it was decorated stood out like the wings of a demon the stranger's hat was off and his high broad forehead white as marble was fully revealed our meeting must be brief he said are you prepared to fulfil the compact what do you require replied auriol possession of the girl i saw three days ago said the other the iron merchant's daughter ebba she must be mine never cried auriol firmly never beware how you tempt me to exert my power said the stranger she must be mine or i defy you rejoined auriol i will never consent fool cried the other seizing him by the arm and fixing a withering glance upon him bring her to me ere the week be out or dread my vengeance and enveloping himself in his cloak he retreated behind the statue and was lost to view as he disappeared a moaning wind arose and heavy rain descended still auriol did not quit the bench end of section six section seven of auriol or the elixir of life by william harrison ainsworth this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sonia chapter six the charles the second spaniel it was about two o'clock on a charming spring day that a stout middle-aged man accompanied by a young person of extraordinary beauty took up his station in front of langham church just as the clock struck the hour a young man issued at a quick pace from a cross street 
and came upon the couple before he was aware of it he was evidently greatly embarrassed and would have beaten a retreat but that was impossible his embarrassment was in some degree shared by the young lady she blushed deeply but could not conceal her satisfaction at the encounter the elder individual who did not appear to notice the confusion of either party immediately extended his hand to the young man and exclaimed what mr darcy is it you why we thought we had lost you sir what took you off so suddenly we have been expecting you these four days and were now walking about to try and find you my daughter has been terribly uneasy haven't you ever the young lady made no answer to this appeal but cast down her eyes it was my intention to call and give you an explanation of my strange conduct to-day replied auriol i hope you received my letter stating that my sudden departure was unavoidable to be sure and i also received the valuable snuff-box you were so good as to send me replied mr thorneycroft but you neglected to tell me how to acknowledge the gift i could not give an address at the moment said auriol well i am glad to find you have got the use of your arm again observed the iron merchant but i can't say you look so well as when you left us you seem paler eh what do you think ebba mr darcy looks as if he were suffering from mental anxiety rather than from bodily ailment she replied timidly i am so replied auriol regarding her fixedly a very disastrous circumstance has happened to me but answer me one question has the mysterious person in the black cloak troubled you again what mysterious person demanded mr thorneycroft opening his eyes never mind father replied ebba i saw him last night she added to auriol i was sitting in the back room alone wondering what had become of you when i heard a tap against the window which was partly open and looking up i beheld the tall stranger it was nearly dark but the light of the fire revealed his malignant countenance i don't exaggerate when i say his eyes gleamed like those of a tiger i was terribly frightened but something prevented me from crying out after gazing at me for a few moments with a look that seemed to fascinate while it frightened me he said you desire to see oriol darcy i have just quitted him go to langham place to-morrow and as the clock strikes two you will behold him without waiting for any reply on my part he disappeared ah you never told me this you little rogue cried mr thorneycroft you persuaded me to come out with you in the hope of meeting mr darcy but you did not say you were sure to find him so you sent this mysterious gentleman to her eh he added to auriol no i did not replied the other gloomily indeed exclaimed the iron merchant with a puzzled look oh then i suppose he thought it might relieve her anxiety however since we have met i hope you'll walk home and dine with us auriol was about to decline the invitation but ebba glanced at him entreatingly i have an engagement but i will forgo it he said offering his arm to her and they walked along towards oxford street while mr thorneycroft followed a few paces behind them this is very kind of you mr darcy said ebba oh i have been so wretched i grieve to hear it he rejoined i hoped you had forgotten me i am sure you did not think so she cried as she spoke she felt a shudder pass through auriol's frame what ails you she anxiously inquired i would have shunned you if i could ebba he replied but a fate against which it is vain to contend has brought us together again i am glad of it she replied because ever since our last interview i have been reflecting on what you then said to me and am persuaded you are labouring under some strange delusion occasioned by your recent accident be not deceived ebba cried auriol i am under a terrible influence i need not remind you of the mysterious individual who tapped at your window last night what of him demanded ebba with a thrill of apprehension he it is who controls my destiny replied auriol but what has he to do with me asked ebba much much he replied with a perceptible shudder you terrify me auriol she rejoined tell me what you mean in pity tell me 
before oriol could reply mr thornycroft stepped forward and turned the conversation into another channel soon after this they reached the quadrant and were passing beneath the eastern colonnade when ebba's attention was attracted towards a man who was leading a couple of dogs by a string while he had others under his arm others again in his pocket and another in his breast it was mr ginger what a pretty little dog cried ebba remarking the charles the second spaniel allow me to present you with it said oriol you know i should value it as coming from you she replied blushing deeply but i cannot accept it so i will not look at it again for fear i should be tempted the dog fancier however noticing ebba's admiration held forward the spaniel and said do just look at the pretty creature miss it hand its equal for beauty don't be afeard on it miss it's as gentle as a lamb oh you little darling ebba said patting its sleek head and long silken ears while it fixed its large black eyes upon her as if entreating her to become its purchaser fairy seems to have taken quite a fancy to you miss observed ginger and she ain't in the habit of falling in love at first sight i don't wonder at it though for my part i should do just the same if i was in her place well now miss as she seems to like you and you seem to like her i won't copy the manners of them ear fathers as has stony arts and part two true loviers you shall have her a bargain what do you call a bargain my good man inquired ebba smiling i wish i could afford to give her to you miss replied ginger you should have her and welcome but i must earn a livelihood and fairy is the most valuable part of my stock i'll tell you what i give for her myself and you shall have her at a trifle beyond it i'd scorn to take advantage of the likes of you i hope you didn't give too much then friend replied ebba i didn't give half her valley not half said ginger and if so be you don't like her in a month's time i'll buy her back again from you you'll always find me here always everybody knows mr ginger that's my name miss i'm the only honest man in the dog fancy in line ask mr bishop the great gunmaker bond street about me him as the knobs calls the bishop a bond street and he tell you but you haven't answered the lady's question said oriol what do you ask for the dog do you want it for yourself sir or for her inquired ginger what does it matter cried oriol angrily a great deal sir replied ginger it'll make a material difference in the price to you she'll be five and twenty guineas to the young lady twenty but suppose i buy her for the young lady said oriol oh then in course you'll get her at the lower figure replied ginger i hope you don't mean to buy the dog interposed mr thornycroft the price is monstrous preposterous it may appear so to you sir said ginger because you're ignorant of the value of such an animal but i can tell you it's cheap dirt cheap why his excellency the prussian ambassador bought a charlie for me the other week to present to a certain duchess of his acquaintance and what d'ye think he give for it i don't know and i don't want to know replied mr thornycroft gruffly eighty guineas said ginger eighty guineas as i'm a livin man and made no bones about it neither the dog i sold him want to be compared with fairy stuff stuff cried mr thornycroft i ain't to be gammoned in that way it's no gammon said ginger look at them ears miss why they're as long as your own ringlets and them pads and i'm sure you won't say she's dear at twenty pound she's a lovely little creature indeed returned ebba again patting the animal's head while this was passing two men of very suspicious mien ensconced behind a pillar adjoining the group were reconnoitring oriol it's him whispered the taller and darker of the two to his companion it's the young man we've been looking for oriol darcy it seems like him said the other edging round the pillar as far as he could without exposure 
i wish he'd turn his face a little more this way it's him i tell you sandman said the tinker we must give the signal to our comrade well i tell you what it is miss said ginger coaxingly your sweetheart i'm sure he's your sweetheart i can tell these things in a minute your sweetheart i say shall give me fifteen pound and the dog's yourn i shall lose five pound by the transaction but i don't mind it for such a customer as you fairy desires a kind missus oriol who had fallen into a fit of abstraction here remarked what's that you are saying fellow i was a saying sir the young lady shall have the dog for fifteen pound and a precious bargain it is replied ginger well then i close with you here's the money said oriol taking out his purse on no account oriol cried ebba quickly it's too much a great deal too much mr darcy said thorneycroft oriol and darcy muttered ginger can this be the gemman we are looking for where's my two pals i wonder oh it's all right he added receiving a signal from behind the pillar they're on the lookout i see give the lady the dog and take the money man said oriol sharply beg pardon sir said ginger but hadn't i better carry the dog home for the young lady it might meet with some accident in the way accident stuff and nonsense cried mr thorneycroft the rascal only wants to follow you home that he may know where you live and steal the dog back again take my advice mr darcy and don't buy it the bargain's concluded said ginger delivering the dog to ebba and taking the money from oriol which having counted he thrust into his capacious breeches pocket how shall i thank you for this treasure oriol exclaimed ebba in an ecstasy of delight by transferring to it all regard you may entertain for me he replied in a low tone that is impossible she answered well i vote we drive away at once said mr thorneycroft hallo jarvie he cried hailing a coach that was passing adding as the vehicle stopped now get in ebba by this means we shall avoid being followed by the rascal so saying he got into the coach as oriol was about to follow him he felt a slight touch on his arm and turning beheld a tall and very forbidding man by his side beg pardon sir said the fellow touching his head but ain't your name mr oriol darcy it is replied oriol regarding him fixedly why do you ask i want a word or two with you in private that's all sir replied the tinker say what you have to say at once rejoined oriol i know nothing of you you'll know me better by and by sir said the tinker in a significant tone i must speak to you and alone if you don't go about your business fellow instantly i'll give you in charge of the police cried oriol no you won't sir no you won't replied the tinker shaking his head and then lowering his voice he added you'll be glad to purchase my silence when you learns what secrets of yourn has come to my knowledge won't you get in mr darcy cried thorneycroft whose back was towards the tinker i must speak to this man replied oriol i'll come to you in the evening till then farewell ebba and as the coach drove away he added to the tinker now rascal what have you to say step this way sir replied the tinker there's two friends of mine as wishes to be present at our conference we'd better walk into a back street end of section seven section eight of oriol or the elixir of life by william harrison ainsworth this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sonia chapter seven the hand again followed by oriol who in his turn was followed by ginger and the sandman the tinker directed his steps to great windmill street where he entered a public house called the black lion leaving his four-footed attendants with the landlord with whom he was acquainted ginger caused the party to be shown into a private room and on entering it oriol flung himself into a chair while the dog-fancier stationed himself near the door 
now what do you want with me demanded auriol you shall learn presently replied the tinker but first it may be as well to state that a certain pocket-book has been found ah exclaimed auriol you are the villains who beset me in the ruined house in the vauxhall road your pocket-book has been found i tell you replied the tinker and from it we have made the most awful discoveries our very air stood on end when we first read the shocking particulars what a bloodthirsty ruffian you must be why we finds you've been in the habit of making away with a young woman once every ten years your last victim was in eighteen twenty the last but one in eighteen ten and the one before her in eighteen hundred hanging's too good for you cried the sandman but if we peaches you're sartin to swing i hope that pretty creature i just see ain't to be the next victim said ginger peace thundered auriol what do you require a hundred pound each will buy our silence replied the tinker we ought to have double that said the sandman for screening such atrocious crimes as he has perpetrated we're not very particular ourselves but we don't commit murder wholesale we don't commit murder at all said ginger you may fancy pursued the tinker that we ain't perfectly acquainted with your history but to prove that we are i'll just rub up your memory did you ever hear tell of a gemman as murdered dr lamb the famous alchemist of queen bess's time and having drank the elixir which the doctor had made for himself has lived ever since did you ever hear tell of such a person i say auriol gazed at him in astonishment what idle tale are you inventing he said at length it is no idle tale replied the tinker boldly we can bring a witness as'll prove the fact a livin witness what witness cried auriol don't you recollect the dwarf as used to serve dr lamb rejoined the tinker he's alive still and we calls him old par on account of his great age where is he what has become of him demanded auriol oh we'll produce him in due time replied the tinker cunningly but tell me where the poor fellow is cried auriol have you seen him since last night i sent him to a public house at kensington but he has disappeared from it and i can discover no traces of him he'll turn up somewhere never fear rejoined the tinker but now sir that we fairly understands each other are you agreeable to our terms you shall give us an order for the money and we'll undertake on our parts not to mislest you more the pocket-book must be delivered up to me if i assent said auriol and the poor dwarf must be found why as to that i can scarcely promise replied the tinker there's a difficulty in the case you see but the pocket-book will never be brought against you you may rest assured of that i must have it or you get nothing from me cried auriol here's a bit of paper as come from the pocket-book said ginger would you like to hear what's written upon it here are the words how many crimes have i to reproach myself with how many innocents have i destroyed and all owing to my fatal compact with give me that paper cried auriol rising and attempting to snatch it from the dog fancier just at this moment and while ginger retreated from auriol the door behind him was noiselessly opened a hand was thrust through the chink and the paper was snatched from his grasp before ginger could turn round the door was closed again hello what's that he cried the paper's gone the hand again cried the sandman in alarm see who's in the passage open the door quick ginger cautiously complied and peeping forth said there's no one there it must be the devil i'll have nothing more to do with the matter pooh pooh don't be so chicken-hearted cried the tinker but come what may 
the German shan't stir till he undertakes to pay us three hundred pounds. You seek to frighten me in vain, villain, cried Oriol, upon whom the recent occurrence had not been lost. I have but to stamp my foot, and I can instantly bring assistance that shall overpower you. Don't provoke him, whispered Ginger, plucking the tinker's sleeve. For my part, I shan't stay any longer. I wouldn't take his money. And he quitted the room. I'll go and see what's the matter with Ginger, said the Sandman, slinking after him. The tinker looked nervously round. He was not proof against his superstitious fears. Here, take this purse and trouble me no more, cried Oriol. The tinker's hands clutched the purse mechanically, but he instantly laid it down again. I'm bad enough, but I won't sell myself to the devil, he said, and he followed his companions. Left alone, Oriol groaned aloud and covered his face with his hands. When he looked up, he found the tall man in the black cloak standing beside him. A demoniacal smile played upon his features. You here? cried Oriol. Of course, replied the stranger. I came to watch over your safety. You were in danger from those men, but you need not concern yourself more about them. I have your pocket-book and the slip of paper that dropped from it. Here are both. Now, let us talk on other matters. You have just parted from Ebba, and will see her again this evening. Perchance, replied Oriol. You will, rejoined the stranger peremptorily. Remember, your ten years' limit draws to a close. In a few days it will be at an end, and if you renew it not, you will incur the penalty, and you know it to be terrible. With the means of renewal in your hands, why hesitate? Because I will not sacrifice the girl, replied Oriol. You cannot help yourself, cried the stranger scornfully. I command you to bring her to me. I persist in my refusal, replied Oriol. It is useless to brave my power, said the stranger. A moon is just born. When it has attained its first quarter, Ebba shall be mine. Till then, farewell. And as the words were uttered, he passed through the door. End of section 8《セクション9》of《オリオル》or《The Elixir of Life》by William Harrison Ainsworth。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Recording by Sonia。Chapter 8 The Barber of London。Who has not heard of the Barber of London? His dwelling is in the neighborhood of Lincoln's Inn. It is needless to particularize the street, for everybody knows the shop. That is to say, every member of the legal profession, high or low. All, to the very judges themselves, have their hair cut or their wigs dressed by him. A pleasant fellow is Mr. Tufnell Trigg, Figaro himself not pleasanter. And if you do not shave yourself, if you want the becoming flow imparted to your stubborn locks, or if you require a wig, I recommend you to the care of Mr. Tufnell Trigg. Not only will he treat you well, but he will regale you with all the gossip of the court. He will give you the last funny thing of Mr. Sergeant Larkins. He will tell you how many briefs the great Mr. Skinner Fine receives, what the vice-chancellor is doing, and you will own, on rising, that you have never spent a five minutes more agreeably. Besides, you are likely to see some noticeable characters, for Mr. Trigg's shop is quite a lounge. Perhaps you may find a young barrister, who has just been called, ordering his first wig, and you may hear the prognostications of Mr. Trigg as to his future distinction. Ah, sir, he will say, glancing at the stolid features of the young man, you have quite the face of the chief justice, quite the face of the chief. I don't recollect him ordering his first wig, that was a little before my time, but I hope to live to see you chief, sir, quite within your reach, if you choose to apply. Sure of it, sir, quite sure." Or you may see him attending to some grave master in chancery, and listening with profound attention to his remarks, 
or screaming with laughter at the jokes of some smart special pleader or talking of the theatres the actors and actresses to some young attorneys or pupils in conveyancers chambers for those are the sort of customers in whom mr trigg chiefly delights with them indeed he is great for it is by them he has been dubbed the barber of london his shop is also frequented by managing clerks barristers clerks engrossing clerks and others but these are for the most part his private friends mr trigg's shop is none of your spruce west end hair-cutting establishments with magnificent mirrors on every side in which you may see the back of your head the front and the side all at once with walls bedizened with glazed french paper and with an ante-room full of bear's grease oils creams tooth powders and cut glass no it is a real barber's and hairdresser's shop of the good old stamp where you may get cut and curled for a shilling and shaved for half the price true the floor is not covered with a carpet but what of that it bears the imprint of innumerable customers and is scattered over with their hair in the window there is an assortment of busts moulded in wax exhibiting the triumphs of mr trigg's art and above these are several specimens of legal wigs on the little counter behind the window amid large pots of pomade and bear's grease and the irons and brushes in constant use by the barber are other bustos done to the life and for ever glancing amiably into the room on the block is a judge's wig which mr trigg has just been dressing and a little farther on a high block is that of a counsel on either side of the fireplace are portraits of lord eldon and lord lyndhurst some other portraits of pretty actresses are likewise to be seen against the counter rests a board displaying the playbill of the evening and near it is a large piece of emblematical crockery indicating that bear's grease may be had on the premises amongst mr trigg's livestock may be enumerated his favourite magpie placed in a wicker cage in the window which chatters incessantly and knows everything its master avouches as well as a christian and now as to mr tufnell trigg himself he is very tall and very thin and holds himself so upright that he loses not an inch of his stature his head is large and his face long with marked if not very striking features charged it must be admitted with a very self-satisfied expression one cannot earn the appellation of the barber of london without talent and it is the consciousness of this talent that lends to mr trigg's features their apparently conceited expression a fringe of black whisker adorns his cheek and chin and his black bristly hair is brushed back so as to exhibit the prodigious expanse of his forehead his eyebrows are elevated as if in constant scorn the attire in which mr trigg is ordinarily seen consists of a black velvet waistcoat and tight black continuations these are protected by a white apron tied around his waist with pockets to hold his scissors and combs over all he wears a short nankeen jacket into the pockets of which his hands are constantly thrust when not otherwise employed a black satin stock with a large bow encircles his throat and his shirt is fastened by black enamel studs such is mr tufnell trigg eclept the barber of london at the time of his introduction to the reader mr trigg had just advertised for an assistant his present young man rutherford watts being about to leave him and set up for himself in canterbury it was about two o'clock and mr trigg had just withdrawn into an inner room to take some refection when on returning he found watts occupied in cutting the hair of a middle-aged sour-looking gentleman who was seated before the fire mr trigg bowed to the sour-looking gentleman and appeared ready to enter into conversation with him but no notice being taken of his advances he went and talked to his magpie while he was chattering to it the sagacious bird screamed forth pretty dear pretty dear ah what's that who is it cried trigg pretty dear pretty dear reiterated the magpie upon this trigg looked round and saw a very singular little man enter the shop he had somewhat the appearance of a groom being clothed in a long grey coat drab knees and small top boots he had a large and remarkably projecting mouth like that of a baboon and a great shock head of black hair pretty dear 
pretty dear screamed the magpie i see nothing pretty about him thought mr trigg what a strange little fellow it would puzzle the lord chancellor himself to say what his age might be the little man took off his hat and making a profound bow to the barber unfolded the times newspaper which he carried under his arm and held it up to trigg what do you want my little friend eh said the barber high wages high wages screamed the magpie is this yours sir replied the little man pointing to an advertisement in the newspaper yes yes that's my advertisement friend replied mr trigg but what of it before the little man could answer a slight interruption occurred while eyeing the newcomer watts neglected to draw forth the hot curling irons in consequence of which he burnt the sour-looking gentleman's forehead and singed his hair take care sir cried the gentleman furiously what the devil are you about yes take care sir as judge learmouth observes to a saucy witness cried trigg take care or i'll commit you damn judge learmouth cried the gentleman angrily if i were a judge i'd hang such a careless fellow sarve him right screamed meg sarve him right beg pardon sir cried watts i'll rectify you in a minute well my little friend observed trigg and what may be your object in coming to me as the great conveyancer mr plodwell observes to his clients what may be your object you want an assistant don't you sir rejoined the little man humbly do you apply on your own account or on behalf of a friend asked trigg on my own replied the little man what are your qualifications demanded trigg what are your qualifications i fancy i understand something of the business replied the little man i was a perruquier myself when wigs were more in fashion than they are now <laughs> indeed said trigg laughing that must have been in the last century in queen anne's time eh you have hit it exactly sir replied the little man it was in queen anne's time perhaps you recollect when wigs were first worn my little nester cried mr trigg perfectly replied the little man french periwigs were first worn in charles the second's time you saw em of course cried the barber with a sneer i did replied the little man quietly oh he must be out of his mind cried trigg we shall have a commission de lunatico to issue here as the master of the rolls would observe i hope i may suit you sir said the little man i don't think you will my friend replied mr trigg i don't think you will you don't seem to have a hand for hairdressing are you aware of the talent the art requires are you aware what it has cost me to earn the enviable title of the barber of london i am as proud of that title as if i were lord chancellor lord chancellor screamed meg precisely meg said mr trigg as if i were lord chancellor well i'm sorry for it said the little man disconsolately pretty dear screamed meg pretty dear what a wonderful bird you have got said the sour-looking gentleman rising and paying mr trigg i declare its answers are quite appropriate ah meg is a clever creature sir that she is replied the barber i gave a good deal for her little or nothing screamed meg little or nothing what is your name friend said the gentleman addressing the little man who still lingered in the shop why sir i've had many names in my time he replied at one time i was called flapdragon at another old par but my real name i believe is morse gregory morse an old bailey answer cried mr trigg shaking his head flapdragon alias old par alias gregory morse alias pretty dear screamed meg and you want a place demanded the sour-looking gentleman eyeing him narrowly sadly replied morse well then follow me said the gentleman 
and i'll see what can be done for you and they left the shop together end of section nine Section 10 of Oriol or the Elixir of Life by William Harrison Ainsworth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sonia. Chapter 9 The Moon in the First Quarter. In spite of his resolution to the contrary, Oriol found it impossible to resist the fascination of Ebba's society and became a daily visitor at her father's house. Mr. Thornycroft noticed the growing attachment between them with satisfaction. His great wish was to see his daughter united to the husband of her choice, and in the hope of smoothing the way, he let Oriol understand that he should give her a considerable marriage portion. For the last few days a wonderful alteration had taken place in Oriol's manner, and he seemed to have shaken off altogether the cloud that had hitherto sat upon his spirits. Enchanted by the change, Ebba indulged in the most blissful anticipations of the future. One evening they walked forth together, and almost unconsciously directed their steps towards the river. Lingering on its banks, they gazed on the full tide, admired the glorious sunset, and breathed over and over again those tender nothings so eloquent in lovers' ears. "'Oh, how different you are from what you were a week ago,' said Ebba playfully promise me not to indulge in any more of those gloomy fancies i will not indulge in them if i can help it rest assured sweet ebba he replied but my spirits are not always under my control i am surprised at my own cheerfulness this evening i never felt so happy she replied and the whole scene is in unison with my feelings how soothing is the calm river flowing at our feet how tender is the warm sky still flushed with red though the sun has set and see yonder hangs the crescent moon she is in her first quarter the moon in her first quarter cried auriol in a tone of anguish all then is over what means this sudden change cried ebba frightened by his looks oh ebba he replied i must leave you i have allowed myself to dream of happiness too long i am an accursed being doomed only to bring misery upon those who love me i warned you on the onset but you would not believe me let me go and perhaps it may not yet be too late to save you oh no do not leave me cried ebba i have no fear while you are with me but you do not know the terrible fate i am linked to he said this is the night when it will be accomplished your moody fancies do not alarm me as they used to do dear auriol she rejoined because i know them to be the fruit of a diseased imagination come let us continue our walk she added taking his arm kindly ebba he cried i implore you to let me go i have not the power to tear myself away unless you aid me i am glad to hear it she rejoined for then i shall hold you fast you know not what you do cried auriol release me oh release me in a few moments the fit will be past she rejoined let us walk towards the abbey <laughs> it is in vain to struggle against fate ejaculated auriol despairingly and he suffered himself to be led in the direction she proposed ebba continued to talk but her discourse fell upon a deaf ear and at last she became silent too in this way they proceeded along millbank street and abingdon street until turning off on the right they found themselves before an old and partly demolished building by this time it had become quite dark for the moon was hidden behind a rack of clouds but a light was seen in the upper story of the structure occasioned no doubt by a fire within it which gave a very picturesque effect to the broken outline of the walls. Pausing for a moment to contemplate the ruin, Ebba expressed the wish to enter it. Oriol offered no opposition, and passing through an arched doorway and ascending a short spiral stone staircase, they presently arrived at a roofless chamber, which it was evident, from the implements and rubbish lying about, was about to be raised to the ground. On one side there was a large arch, partly bricked up, 
through which opened a narrow doorway though at some height from the ground with this a plank communicated while beneath it lay a great heap of stones amongst which were some grotesque carved heads in the centre of the chamber was a large square opening like the mouth of a trap-door from which the top of a ladder projected and near it stood a flaming brazier which had cast forth the glare seen from below over the ruinous walls on the right hung the crescent moon now emerged from the cloud and shedding a ghostly glimmer on the scene what a strange place cried ebba gazing around with some apprehension it looks like a spot one reads of in romance i wonder where that trap leads to into the vault beneath no doubt replied auriol but why did we come hither <laughs> as he spoke there was a sound like mocking laughter but whence arising it was difficult to say did you hear that sound cried auriol it was nothing but the echo of laughter from the street she replied you alarm yourself without reason auriol no not without reason he cried i am in the power of a terrible being who seeks to destroy you and i know that he is at hand listen to me ebba and however strange my recital may appear do not suppose it the ravings of a madman but be assured it is the truth beware cried a deep voice issuing apparently from the depth of the vault some one spoke cried ebba i begin to share your apprehensions let us quit this place come then said auriol not so fast cried a deep voice and they beheld the mysterious owner of the black cloak barring their passage out ebba you are mine cried the stranger auriol has brought you to me it is false cried auriol i never will yield her to you <laughs> remember your compact rejoined the stranger with a mocking laugh oh auriol cried ebba i fear for your soul you have not made a compact with this fiend he has replied the stranger and by that compact you are surrendered to me and as he spoke he advanced towards her and enveloping her in his cloak her cries were instantly stifled you shall not go cried auriol seizing him release her or i renounce you wholly fool cried the stranger since you provoke my wrath take your doom and he stamped on the ground at this signal an arm was thrust from the trap-door and auriol's hand was seized with an iron grasp while this took place the stranger bore his lovely burden swiftly up the plank leading to the narrow doorway in the wall and just as he was passing through it he pointed towards the sky and shouted with a mocking smile to auriol behold the moon is in her first quarter my words are fulfilled and he disappeared auriol tried to disengage himself from the grasp imposed upon him in vain uttering ejaculations of rage and despair he was dragged forcibly backwards into the vault end of section ten Section 11 of Oriol or the Elixir of Life by William Harrison Ainsworth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sonia. Chapter 10. The Statue at Charing Cross. One morning, two persons took their way along Parliament Street and Whitehall, and chatting as they walked, turned into the entrance of Spring Gardens for the purpose of looking at the statue at Charing Cross one of them was remarkable for his dwarfish stature and strange withered features the other was a man of middle size thin rather elderly and with a sharp countenance the sourness of which was redeemed by a strong expression of benevolence he was clad in a black coat rather rusty but well brushed buttoned up to the chin black tights short drab gaiters and wore a white neckcloth and spectacles mr loftus for so he was called was a retired merchant of moderate fortune and lived in abingdon street 
he was a bachelor and therefore pleased himself and being a bit of an antiquary rambled about all day long in search of some object of interest his walk on the present occasion was taken with that view by jove what a noble statue that is morse cried loftus gazing at it the horse is magnificent positively magnificent i recollect when the spot was occupied by a gibbet and when in lieu of a statue an effigy of the martyred monarch was placed there replied morse that was in the time of the protectorate you cannot get those dreams out of your head morse said loftus smiling i wish i could persuade myself i had lived for two centuries and a half would ye could have seen the ancient cross which once stood there erected by edward i to his beloved wife eleanor of castile said morse heedless of the other's remark it was much mutilated when i remember it some of the pinnacles were broken and the foliage defaced but the statues of the queen were still standing in the recesses and altogether the effect was beautiful it must have been charming observed loftus rubbing his hands and though i like the statue i would much rather have had the old gothic cross but how fortunate the former escaped destruction in oliver cromwell's time i can tell you how that came to pass sir replied morse for i was assistant to john rivers the brazier to whom the statue was sold ah indeed exclaimed loftus i have heard something of the story but should like to have full particulars you shall hear them then replied morse yon statue which as you know was cast by hubert le sieur in sixteen thirty three was ordered by parliament to be sold and broken to pieces well my master john rivers being a stanch royalist though he did not dare to avow his principles determined to preserve it from destruction accordingly he offered a good round sum for it and was declared the purchaser but how to dispose of it was the difficulty he could trust none of his men but me whom he knew to be as hearty a hater of the roundheads and as loyal to the memory of our slaughtered sovereign as himself well we digged a great pit secretly in the cellar whither the statue had been conveyed and buried it the job occupied us nearly a month and during that time my master collected together all the pieces of old brass he could procure these he afterwards produced and declared they were the fragments of the statue but the cream of the jest was to come he began to cast handles of knives and forks in brass giving it out that they were made from the metal of the statue and plenty of em he sold too for the cavaliers bought them as memorials of their martyred monarch and the roundheads as evidences of his fall in this way he soon got back his outlay <laughs> laughed loftus well in due season came the restoration pursued morse and my master made known to king charles the second the treasure he had kept concealed for him it was digged forth placed in its old position but i forget whether the brazier was rewarded i rather think not no matter cried loftus he was sufficiently rewarded by the consciousness of having done a noble action but let us go and examine the sculpture on the pedestal more closely with this he crossed over the road and taking off his hat thrust his head through the iron railing surrounding the pedestal while morse in order to point out the beauties of the sculpture with greater convenience mounted upon a stump beside him you are aware that this is the work of grinling gibbons sir cried the dwarf to be sure i am replied loftus to be sure what fancy and gusto is displayed in the treatment of these trophies the execution of the royal arms is equally admirable cried morse never saw anything finer rejoined loftus never upon my life every one knows how easily a crowd is collected in london and it cannot be supposed that our two antiquaries would be allowed to pursue their investigations unmolested 
several ragged urchins got round them and tried to discover what they were looking at at the same time cutting their jokes upon them these were speedily joined by a street sweeper rather young in the profession a ticket porter a butcher's apprentice an old israelitish clothesman a coal heaver and a couple of charity boys my eyes cried the street sweeper only twig these calves if they ain't green uns i'm done old spectacles thinks he has found it all out remarked the porter we shall hear what it all means by and by flesh my art cried the jew what two funny old gentlemen i wonder what they thinks they sees i'll tell ye master rejoined the butcher's apprentice they're a-trying which one of them can see fathers into a millstone only think of living all my life in london and never examining this admirable work of art before cried loftus quite unconscious that he had become the object of general curiosity look closer at it old gentleman cried the porter the nearer you get the more you'll admire it quite true replied loftus fancying morse had spoken it'll bear the closest inspection i say ned observed one of the charity boys to the other do you get over the railing they must have dropped somewhat inside see what it is i'm afraid of spiking myself joe replied the other but just give us a lift and i'll try what are you arter there you young rascals cried the coal heaver come down or i'll send the police to you what two precious guys these is cried a ragamuffin lad accompanied by a bulldog i've a good mind to chuck the little on off the post and set tartar at him here boy here that'd be famous fun indeed spicer cried another rapscallion behind him hurrah let em alone will you there ye young devils cried an irish bricklayer don't you see they're only two peaceable antiquaries oh they're antiquaries are they screamed the little street sweeper well i never see the likes on them afore did you sam never replied the porter ach murder in irish ye're a setting me in all the fruits of my industry cried an apple woman against whom the bricklayer had run his barrow devil seize you for a careless wagabone why don't you look where you're going and not drive into people in that way ex pardon molly said the bricklayer but i was so interested in them antiquaries that i didn't observe you antiquaries be hanged what's such warming to me cried the apple woman furiously you've destroyed my day's market and bad luck to ye well never heed molly cried the good-natured bricklayer i'll make it up to you pick up your apples and ye shall have a drop of the crater if you'll come along with me while this was passing a stout gentleman came from the farther side of the statue and perceiving loftus cried why brother-in-law is that you but loftus was too much engrossed to notice him and continued to expiate upon the beauty of the trophies what are you talking about brother cried the stout gentleman grinling gibbons replied loftus without turning round horace walpole said that no one before him could give to wood the airy lightness of a flower and here he has given it to a stone this may be all very fine my good fellow said the stout gentleman seizing him by the shoulder but don't you see the crowd you're collecting round you you'll be mobbed presently why how the devil did you come here brother thornycroft cried loftus at last recognizing him come along and i'll tell you replied the iron merchant dragging him away while morse followed closely behind them i'm so glad to have met you pursued thornycroft as soon as they were clear of the mob you'll be shocked to hear what has happened to your niece ebba why what has happened to her demanded loftus you alarm me out with it at once i hate to be kept in suspense she has left me replied thornycroft left her old indulgent father run away run away exclaimed loftus impossible i'll not believe it even from your lips would it were not so but it is alas too true 
replied thornycroft mournfully and the thing was so unnecessary for i would gladly have given her to the young man my sole hope is that she has not utterly disgraced herself no she is too high principled for that cried loftus rest easy on that score but with whom has she run away with a young man named oriel darcy replied thornycroft he was brought to my house under peculiar circumstances i never heard of him said loftus but i have interposed morse i've known him these two hundred years a day who's this cried thornycroft a crack-brained little fellow whom i've engaged as valet replied loftus he fancies he was born in queen elizabeth's time it's no fancy cried morse i am perfectly acquainted with oriel darcy's history he drank of the same elixir as myself if you know him can you give us a clue to find him asked thornycroft i am sorry i cannot replied morse i only saw him for a few minutes the other night after i had been thrown into the serpentine by the tall man in the black cloak what's that you say cried thornycroft quickly i have heard ebba speak of a tall man in a black cloak having some mysterious connection with oriol i hope that person has nothing to do with her disappearance i shouldn't wonder if he had replied morse i believe that black gentleman to be what who demanded thornycroft neither more nor less than the devil replied morse mysteriously Pshaw, pooh cried loftus i told you the poor fellow was half cracked at this moment a roguish-looking fellow with red whiskers and hair and clad in a velveteen jacket with ivory buttons who had been watching the iron merchant at some distance came up and touching his hat said mr thornycroft i believe my name is thornycroft fellow cried the iron merchant eyeing him askance and your name i fancy is ginger exactly sir replied the dog fancier again touching his hat exactly i didn't think you would recollect me sir i bring you some news of your daughter of ebba exclaimed thornycroft in a tone of deep emotion i hope your news is good i wish it was better for her sake as well as yours sir replied the dog fancier gravely but i'm afeard she's in very bad hands that she is if she's in the hands of the black gentleman observed morse why old pa that ain't you cried ginger gazing at him in astonishment why ow oh, you are transmogrified to be sure but what of my daughter cried thornycroft where is she take me to her and you shall be well rewarded i'll do my best to take you to her and without any reward sir replied ginger for my heart bleeds for the poor young creature as i said afore she's in dreadful bad hands do you allude to mr oriel darcy cried thornycroft no he's as much a victim of this infernal plot as your daughter replied ginger i thought him quite different at first but i've altered my mind entirely since some matters has come to my knowledge you alarm me greatly by these dark hints cried thornycroft what is to be done i shall know in a few hours replied ginger i ain't got the exact clue yet but come to me at eleven o'clock to-night at the turk's head at the back of shoreditch church and i'll put you on the right scent you must come alone i should wish this gentleman my brother-in-law to accompany me said thornycroft he couldn't help you replied ginger i'll take care to have plenty of assistance it's a dangerous business and can only be managed in a certain way and by a certain person and he'd object to any one but you to-night at eleven good-bye old par we shall meet again ere long and without a word more he hurried away End of section eleven section twelve of oriol or the elixir of life by william harrison ainsworth this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sonia chapter eleven preparations 
on that same night at the appointed hour mr thornycroft repaired to shoreditch and entering a narrow street behind the church speedily discovered the turk's head at the door of which a hackney coach was standing he was shown by the landlord into a small back room in which three men were seated at a small table smoking and drinking gin and water while a fourth was standing near the fire with his back towards the door the latter was a tall powerfully built man wrapped in a rough greatcoat and did not turn round on the iron merchant's entrance you are punctual mr thornycroft said ginger who was one of the trio at the table and i'm happy to say i've arranged everything for you sir my friends are ready to undertake the job only they won't do it on quite such easy terms as mine the tinker and the sandman coughed slightly to intimate their entire concurrence in mr ginger's remark as i said to you this morning mr thornycroft pursued ginger this is a difficult and a dangerous business and there's no knowing what may come of it but it's your only chance of recovering your darter yes it's your only chance echoed the tinker we're about to risk our precious lives for you sir said the sandman so in course we expect a proportionate reward if you enable me to regain my daughter you shall not find me ungrateful rejoined the iron merchant i must have a hundred pounds said the tinker that's my lowest and mine too said the sandman i shall take nothing but the glory as i said afore remarked ginger i am sworn champion of poor distressed young damsels but my friends must make their own bargains well i assent returned mr thornycroft and the sooner we set out the better are you armed asked ginger i have a brace of pistols in my pocket replied thornycroft all right then we've all got pops and cutlashes said ginger so let's be off as he spoke the tinker and sandman arose and the man in the rough greatcoat who had hitherto remained with his back to them turned round to the iron merchant's surprise he perceived that the face of this individual was covered with a piece of black crape who is this he demanded with some misgivings a friend replied ginger without him we could do nothing his name is reeks and he is the chief man in our enterprise he claims a reward too i suppose said thornycroft i will tell you what reward i claim mr thornycroft rejoined reeks in a deep stern tone when all is over meantime give me your solemn pledge that whatever you may behold to-night you will not divulge it i give it replied the iron merchant provided always no provision sir interrupted the other quickly you must swear to keep silence unconditionally or i will not move a footstep with you and i alone can guide you where your daughter is detained swear sir it is your only chance whispered ginger well if it must be i do swear to keep silence rejoined mr thornycroft but your proceedings appear very mysterious the whole affair is mysterious replied reeks you must also consent to have a bandage passed over your eyes when you get into the coach anything more asked the iron merchant you must engage to obey my orders without questioning when we arrive at our destination rejoined reeks otherwise there is no chance of success be it as you will returned thornycroft i must perforce agree all then is clearly understood said reeks and we can now set out upon this ginger conducted mr thornycroft to the coach and as soon as the latter got into it tied a handkerchief tightly over his eyes in this state mr thornycroft heard the tinker and the sandman take their places near him but not remarking the voice of reeks concluded that he must have got outside the next moment the coach was put in motion and rattled over the stones at a rapid pace it made many turns but at length proceeded steadily onwards while from the profound silence around and the greater freshness of the air mr thornycroft began to fancy they had gained the country not a word was spoken by any one during the ride after a while the coach stopped the door was opened and mr thornycroft was helped out the iron merchant expected his bandage would now be removed but he was mistaken for reeks taking his arm 
drew him along at a quick pace as they advanced the iron merchant's conductor whispered him to be cautious and at the same time made him keep close to a wall a door was presently opened and as soon as the party had passed through it closed the bandage was then removed from thorneycroft's eyes and he found himself in a large and apparently neglected garden though the sky was cloudy there was light enough to enable him to distinguish that they were near an old dilapidated mansion we are now arrived said reeks to the iron merchant and you will have need of all your resolution i will deliver her or perish in the attempt said thorneycroft taking out his pistols the others drew their cutlasses now then follow me said reeks and act as i direct with this he struck into an alley formed by thick hedges of privet which brought them to the back part of the house passing through a door he entered the yard and creeping cautiously along the wall reached a low window which he contrived to open without noise he then passed through it and was followed by the others end of section 12section thirteen of oriole or the elixir of life by william harrison ainsworth this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sonia chapter twelve the chamber of mystery we shall now return to the night of ebba's seizure by the mysterious stranger though almost deprived of consciousness by terror the poor girl could distinguish from the movements of her captor that she was borne down a flight of steps or some steep descent and then for a considerable distance along level ground she was next placed in a carriage which was driven with great swiftness and though it was impossible to conjecture in what direction she was conveyed it seemed to her terrified imagination as if she were hurried down a precipice and she expected every moment to be dashed in pieces at length the vehicle stopped and she was lifted out of it and carried along a winding passage after which the creaking of hinges announced that a door was opened having passed through it she was deposited on a bench when fright overmastering her her senses completely forsook her on recovering she found herself seated on a fauteuil covered with black velvet in the midst of a gloomy chamber of vast extent while beside her and supporting her from falling stood the mysterious and terrible stranger he held a large goblet filled with some potent liquid to her lips and compelled her to swallow a portion of it the powerful stimulant revived her but at the same time produced a strange excitement against which she struggled with all her power her persecutor again held the goblet towards her while a sardonic smile played upon his features drink he cried it will restore you and you have much to go through ebba mechanically took the cup and raised it to her lips but noticing the stranger's glance of exultation dashed it to the ground you have acted foolishly he said sternly the potion would have done you good withdrawing her eyes from his gaze which she felt exercised an irresistible influence over her ebba gazed fearfully round the chamber it was vast and gloomy and seemed like the interior of a sepulchre the walls and ceiling being formed of black marble while the floor was paved with the same material not far from where she sat on an estrade approached by a couple of steps stood a table covered with black velvet on which was placed an immense lamp fashioned like an imp supporting a cauldron on his outstretched wings in this lamp were several burners which cast a lurid light throughout the chamber over it hung a cap equally fantastically fashioned a dagger with a richly wrought hilt was stuck into the table and beside it lay a strangely shaped mask an open book an antique inkstand and a piece of parchment on which some characters were inscribed opposite these stood a curiously carved ebony chair at the lower end of the room which was slightly elevated above the rest hung a large black curtain and on the step in the front of it were placed two vases of jet what is behind that curtain shudderingly demanded ebba of her companion you will see anon he replied meanwhile seat yourself on that chair and glance at the writing on the scroll ebba did not move but the stranger took her hand 
and drew her to the seat read what is written on that paper he cried imperiously ebba glanced at the document and a shudder passed over her frame by this she cried i surrender myself soul and body to you <laughs> you do replied the stranger i have committed no crime that can place me within the power of the fiend cried ebba falling upon her knees i call upon heaven for protection avaunt as the words were uttered the cap suddenly fell upon the lamp and the chamber was buried in profound darkness mocking laughter rang in her ears succeeded by wailing cries inexpressibly dreadful to hear <laughs> Ebba continued to pray fervently for her own deliverance and for that of Oriol. In the midst of her supplications, she was aroused by strains of music of the most exquisite sweetness, proceeding apparently from behind the curtain, and while listening to these sounds, she was startled by a deafening crash as if a large gong had been stricken. The cover of the lamp was then slowly raised and the burners blazed forth as before while from the two vases in front of the curtain arose clouds of incense filling the chamber with stupefying fragrance again the gong was stricken and ebba looked round towards the curtain above each vase towered a gigantic figure wrapped in a long black cloak the lower part of which was concealed by the thick vapour hoods like the cowls of monks were drawn over the heads of these grim and motionless figures mufflers enveloped their chins and they wore masks from the holes of which gleamed eyes of unearthly brightness their hands were crossed upon their breasts between them squatted two other spectral forms similarly cloaked hooded and masked with their gleaming eyes fixed upon her and their skinny fingers pointing derisively at her behind the curtain was placed a strong light which showed a wide staircase of black marble leading to some upper chamber and at the same time through the reflection of a gigantic figure upon the drapery while a hand the finger of which pointed towards her was thrust from an opening between its folds forcibly averting her gaze ebba covered her eyes with her hands but looking up again after a brief space beheld an ebon door at the side revolve upon its hinges and give entrance to three female figures robed in black hooded and veiled and having their hands folded in a melancholy manner across their breasts slowly and noiselessly advancing they halted within a few paces of her who and what are ye she cried wild with terror the victims of oriol replied the figure on the right as we are such will you be ere long what crime have you committed demanded ebba we have loved him replied the second figure is that a crime cried ebba if so i am equally culpable with you you will share our doom replied the third figure heaven have mercy upon me exclaimed the agonized girl dropping upon her knees at this moment a terrible voice from behind the curtain exclaimed sign or oriol is lost forever i cannot yield my soul even to save him cried ebba distractedly witness his chastisement then cried the voice and as the words were uttered a side door was opened on the opposite side and oriol was dragged forth from it by two masked personages who looked like familiars of the inquisition do not yield to the demands of this fiend ebba cried oriol gazing at her distractedly will you save him before he is cast living into the tomb cried the voice and at the words a heavy slab of marble rose slowly from the floor near where ebba sat and disclosed a dark pit beneath ebba gazed into the abyss with indescribable terror there he will be immured unless you sign cried the voice and as he is immortal he will endure an eternity of torture <laughs> i cannot save him so but i may precede him cried ebba and throwing her hands aloft 
she flung herself into the pit a fearful cry resounded through the chamber it broke from oriol who vainly strove to burst from those who held him and precipitate himself after ebba soon after this and while oriol was gazing into the abyss a tongue of blue flame arose from it danced for a moment in the air and then vanished no sooner was it gone than a figure shrouded in black habiliments and hooded and muffled up like the three other female forms slowly ascended from the vault apparently without support and remained motionless at its brink ebba exclaimed oriol in a voice of despair is it you the figure bowed its head but spoke not sign thundered the voice your attempt at self-destruction has placed you wholly in my power sign at this injunction the figure moved slowly towards the table and to his unspeakable horror oriol beheld it take up the pen and write upon the parchment he bent forward and saw that the name inscribed thereon was ebba thornycroft the groan to which he gave utterance was echoed by a roar of diabolical laughter oh. <laughs> the figure then moved slowly away and ranged itself with the other veiled forms all is accomplished cried the voice away with him on this a terrible clangour was heard the lights were extinguished and oriol was dragged through the doorway from which he had been brought forth end of the first book end of section 13《Section 14 of Oriol or the Elixir of Life by William Harrison Ainsworth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sonia. Intermine, 1800. Chapter 1. The Tomb of the Rosicrucian. On the night of the 1st of March, 1800, and at a late hour, a man, wrapped in a large horseman's cloak and of strange and sinister appearance, entered an old deserted house in the neighbourhood of stepney green he was tall carried himself very erect and seemed in the full vigour of early manhood but his features had a worn and ghastly look as if bearing the stamp of long indulged and frightful excesses while his dark gleaming eyes gave him an expression almost diabolical this person had gained the house from a garden behind it and now stood in a large dismantled hall from which a broad oaken staircase with curiously carved banisters led to a gallery and thence to the upper chambers of the habitation nothing could be more dreary than the aspect of the place the richly moulded ceiling was festooned with spiders webs and in some places had fallen in heaps upon the floor the glories of the tapestry upon the walls were obliterated by damps the squares of black and white marble with which the hall was paved were loosened and quaked beneath the footsteps the wide and empty fireplace yawned like the mouth of a cavern the bolts of the closed windows were rusted in their sockets and the heaps of dust before the outer door proved that long years had elapsed since any one had passed through it taking a dark lantern from beneath his cloak the individual in question gazed for a moment around him and then with a sardonic smile playing upon his features directed his steps towards a room on the right the door of which stood open this chamber which was large and cased with oak was wholly unfurnished like the hall and in an equally dilapidated condition the only decoration remaining on its walls was the portrait of a venerable personage in the cap and gown of henry the eighth time painted against a panel a circumstance which had probably saved it from destruction and beneath it fixed in another panel a plate of brass covered with mystical characters and symbols and inscribed with the name Cyprianus de Rougemont, Fra R. C. The same name likewise appeared upon a label beneath the portrait, with the date 1550. Pausing before the portrait, the young man threw the light of the lantern full upon it, and revealed features somewhat resembling his own in form, but of a severe and philosophic cast. In the eyes alone could be discerned the peculiar and terrible glimmer which distinguished his own glances after regarding the portrait for some time fixedly he thus addressed it 
dost hear me old ancestor he cried i thy descendant cyprian de rougemont call upon thee to point out where thy gold is hidden i know that thou wert a brother of the rosy cross one of the illuminati and didst penetrate the mysteries of nature and enter the region of light i know also that thou wert buried in this house with a vast treasure but though i have made diligent search for it and others have searched before me thy grave has never yet been discovered listen to me methought satan appeared to me in a dream last night and bade me come hither and i should find what i sought the conditions he proposed were that i should either give him my own soul or win him that of oriel darcy i assented i am here where is thy treasure after a pause he struck the portrait with his clenched hand exclaiming in a loud voice dost hear me i say old ancestor i call on thee to give me thy treasure dost hear i say and he repeated the blow with greater violence disturbed by the shock the brass plate beneath the picture started from its place and fell to the ground what is this cried rougemont gazing into the aperture left by the plate ha <laughs> my invocation has been heard and snatching up the lantern he discovered at the bottom of a little recess about two feet deep a stone with an iron ring in the centre of it uttering a joyful cry he seized the ring and drew the stone forward without difficulty disclosing an open space beyond it this then is the entrance to my ancestor's tomb cried rougemont there can be no doubt of it the old rosicrucian has kept his secret well but the devil has helped me to wrest it from him and now to procure the necessary implements in case as is not unlikely i should experience further difficulty with this he hastily quitted the room but returned almost immediately with a mallet a lever and a pitchfork armed with which and the lantern he crept through the aperture this done he found himself at the head of a stone staircase which he descended and came to the arched entrance of a vault the door which was of stout oak was locked but holding up the light towards it he read the following inscription post ducentos quinquaginta annos patebo quindecim quinquaginta in two hundred and fifty years i shall open cried rougemont and the date fifteen fifty why the exact time is arrived old cyprian must have foreseen what would happen and evidently intended to make me his heir there was no occasion for the devil's interference and see the key is in the lock so and he turned it and pushing against the door with some force the rusty hinges gave way and it fell inwards from the aperture left by the fallen door a soft and silvery light streamed forth and stepping forward rougemont found himself in a spacious vault from the ceiling of which hung a large globe of crystal containing in its heart a little flame which diffused a radiance gentle as that of the moon around this then was the ever-burning lamp of the rosicrucians and rougemont gazed at it with astonishment two hundred and fifty years had elapsed since that wondrous flame had been lighted and yet it burned on brightly as ever hooped around the globe was a serpent with its tail in its mouth an emblem of eternity wrought in purest gold while above it were a pair of silver wings in allusion to the soul massive chains of the more costly metal fashioned like twisted snakes served as suspenders to the lamp but rougemont's astonishment at this marvel quickly gave way to other feelings and he gazed around the vault with greedy eyes it was a septilateral chamber about eight feet high built of stone and supported by beautifully groined arches the surface of the masonry was as smooth and fresh as if the chisel had only just left it in six of the corners were placed large chests ornamented with ironwork of the most exquisite workmanship and these rougemont's imagination pictured as filled with inexhaustible treasure while in the seventh corner near the door was a beautiful little piece of monumental sculpture in white marble representing two kneeling and hooded figures holding a veil between them which partly concealed the entrance to a small recess 
on one of the chests opposite the monument just described stood a strangely formed bottle and a cup of antique workmanship both encrusted with gems the walls were covered with circles squares and diagrams and in some places were ornamented with grotesque carvings in the centre of the vault was a round altar of black marble covered with a plate of gold on which rougemont read the following inscription hoc universi compendium unius mihi sepulcrum feci here then old cyprian lies he cried and prompted by some irresistible impulse he seized the altar by the upper rim and overthrew it the heavy mass of marble fell with a thundering crash breaking asunder the flag beneath it it might be the reverberation of the vaulted roof but a deep groan seemed to reproach the young man for his sacrilege undeterred however by this warning rougemont placed the point of the lever between the interstices of the broken stone and exerting all his strength speedily raised the fragments and laid open the grave within it in the garb he wore in life with his white beard streaming to his waist lay the uncoffined body of his ancestor cyprian de rougemont the corpse had evidently been carefully embalmed and the features were unchanged by decay upon the breast with the hands placed over it lay a large book bound in black vellum and fastened with brazen clasps instantly possessing himself of this mysterious-looking volume rougemont knelt upon the nearest chest and opened it but he was disappointed in his expectations all the pages he examined were filled with cabalistic characters which he was totally unable to decipher at length however he chanced upon one page the import of which he comprehended and he remained for some time absorbed in its contemplation while an almost fiendish smile played upon his features ah uh -huh. he exclaimed closing the volume i see now the cause of my extraordinary dream my ancestor's wondrous power was of infernal origin the result in fact of a compact with the prince of darkness <laughs> but what care i for that give me wealth no matter what source it comes from <laughs> and seizing the lever he broke open the chest beside him it was filled with bars of silver the next he visited in the same way was full of gold the third was laden with pearls and precious stones and the rest contained treasure to an incalculable amount rougemont gazed at them in transports of joy at length i have my wish he cried boundless wealth and therefore boundless power is mine i can riot in pleasure riot in vengeance as to my soul i will run the risk of its perdition but it shall go hard if i destroy not that of oriel his love of play and his passion for edith talbot shall be the means by which i will work but i must not neglect another agent which is offered me that bottle i have learned from yon volume contains an infernal potion which without destroying life shatters the brain and creates maddening fancies <laughs> it will well serve my purpose and i thank thee satan for the gift end of section 14section 15 of oriol or the elixir of life by william harrison ainsworth this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sonia chapter two the compact about two months after this occurrence and near midnight a young man was hurrying along pall mall with a look of the wildest despair when his headlong course was suddenly arrested by a strong grasp while a familiar voice sounded in his ear it is useless to meditate self-destruction oriel darcy cried the person who had checked him if you find life a burden i can make it tolerable to you turning round at the appeal oriel beheld a tall man wrapped in a long black cloak whose sinister features were well known to him leave me rougemont he cried fiercely i want no society above all not yours you know very well that you have ruined me and that nothing more is to be got from me leave me i say 
or i may do you a mischief <laughs> oriol i am your friend replied rougemont i purpose to relieve your distress will you give me back the money you have won from me cried oriol will you pay my inexorable creditors will you save me from a prison i will do all this and more replied rougemont i will make you one of the richest men in london spare your insulting jests sir cried oriol i am in no mood to bear them i am not jesting rejoined rougemont come with me and you shall be convinced of my sincerity oriol at length assented and they turned into st james square and paused before a magnificent house rougemont ascended the steps oriol who had accompanied him almost mechanically gazed at him with astonishment do you live here he inquired ask no questions replied rougemont knocking at the door which was instantly opened by a hall porter while other servants in rich liveries appeared at a distance rougemont addressed a few words in an undertone to them and they instantly bowed respectfully to oriol while the foremost of them led the way up a magnificent staircase all this was a mystery to the young man but he followed his conductor without a word and was presently ushered into a gorgeously furnished and brilliantly illuminated apartment the servant then left them and as soon as he was gone oriol exclaimed is it to mock me that you have brought me hither to mock you no replied rougemont i have told you that i mean to make you rich but you look greatly exhausted a glass of wine will revive you and as he spoke he stepped towards a small cabinet and took from it a curiously shaped bottle and a goblet taste this wine it has been long in our family he added filling the cup it is a strange bewildering drink cried oriol setting down the empty goblet and passing his hand before his eyes you have taken it upon an empty stomach that is all said rougemont you will be better anon i feel as if i were going mad cried oriol it is some damnable potion you have given me ha <laughs> ha laughed rougemont it reminds you of the elixir you once quaffed eh a truce to this raillery cried oriol angrily i have said i am in no mood to bear it pshaw i mean no offence rejoined the other changing his manner what think you of this house that it is magnificent replied oriol gazing around i envy you its possession it shall be yours if you please replied rougemont mine you are mocking me not in the least you shall buy it from me if you please at what price asked oriol bitterly at a price you can easily pay replied the other come this way and we will conclude the bargain proceeding towards the farther end of the room they entered a small exquisitely furnished chamber surrounded with sofas of the most luxurious description in the midst was a table on which writing materials were placed it were a fruitless boon to give you this house without the means of living in it said rougemont carefully closing the door this pocket-book will furnish you with them notes to an immense amount cried oriol opening the pocket-book and glancing at its contents they are yours together with the house cried rougemont if you will but sign a compact with me a compact cried oriol regarding him with a look of undefinable terror who and what are you some men would call me the devil replied rougemont carelessly but you know me too well to suppose that i merit such a designation i offer you wealth what more could you require but upon what terms demanded oriol the easiest imaginable replied the other you shall judge for yourself and as he spoke he opened a writing-desk upon the table and took from it a parchment sit down he added and read this oriol complied and as he scanned the writing 
he became transfixed with fear and astonishment while the pocket-book dropped from his grasp after a while he looked up at rougemont who was leaning over his shoulder and whose features were wrinkled with a derisive smile then you are the fiend he cried if you will have it so certainly replied the other you are satan in the form of the man i once knew cried auriol avaunt i will have no dealings with you i thought you wiser than to indulge in such idle fears darcy rejoined the other granting even your silly notion of me to be correct why need you be alarmed you are immortal true rejoined auriol thoughtfully but yet pshaw rejoined the other sign and have done with the matter by this compact i am bound to deliver a victim a female victim whenever you shall require it cried auriol precisely replied the other you can have no difficulty in fulfilling that condition but if i fail in doing so i am doomed but you will not fail interrupted the other lighting a taper and sealing the parchment now sign it auriol mechanically took the pen and gazed fixedly on the document i shall bring eternal destruction on myself if i sign it he muttered a stroke of the pen will rescue you from utter ruin said rougemont leaning over his shoulder riches and happiness are yours you will not have such another chance mm, tempter cried auriol hastily attaching his signature to the paper but he instantly started back aghast at the fiendish laugh that rang in his ears <laughs> i repent give it me back he cried endeavouring to snatch the parchment which rougemont thrust into his bosom it is too late cried the latter in a triumphant tone you are mine irredeemably mine ha <laughs> exclaimed auriol sinking back on the couch i leave you in possession of your house pursued rougemont but i shall return in a week when i shall require my first victim your first victim oh heaven exclaimed auriol ay and my choice falls on edith talbot replied rougemont edith talbot exclaimed auriol she your victim think you i would resign her i love better than life to you <laughs> it is because she loves you that i have chosen her rejoined rougemont with a bitter laugh and such will ever be the case with you seek not to love again for your passion will be fatal to the object of it when the week has elapsed i shall require edith at your hands till then farewell stay cried auriol i break the bargain with thee fiend i will have none of it i abjure thee and he rushed wildly after rougemont who had already gained the larger chamber but ere he could reach him the mysterious individual had passed through the outer door and when auriol emerged upon the gallery he was nowhere to be seen several servants immediately answered the frantic shouts of the young man and informed him that mr rougemont had quitted the house some moments ago telling them that their master was perfectly satisfied with the arrangements he had made for him and we hope nothing has occurred to alter your opinion sir said the hall porter you are sure mr rougemont is gone cried auriol oh quite sure sir cried the hall porter i helped him on with his cloak myself he said he should return this day week if he comes i will not see him cried auriol sharply mind that deny me to him and on no account whatever let him enter the house your orders shall be strictly obeyed replied the porter staring with surprise now leave me cried auriol and as they quitted him he added in a tone and with a gesture of the deepest despair all precautions are useless i am indeed lost
End of section 15. Section 16 of Oriole or the Elixir of Life by William Harrison Ainsworth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sonia. Chapter 3 Irresolution. On returning to the cabinet, where his fatal compact with Rougemont had been signed, Oriole perceived the pocket book lying on the floor near the table, and taking it up, he was about to deposit it in the writing desk when an irresistible impulse prompted him once more to examine its contents unfolding the roll of notes he counted them and found they amounted to more than a hundred thousand pounds the sight of so much wealth and the thought of the pleasure and the power it would procure him gradually dispelled his fears and arising in a transport of delight he exclaimed yes yes all obstacles are now removed when mr talbot finds i am become thus wealthy he will no longer refuse me his daughter but i am mad he added suddenly checking himself worse than mad to indulge such hopes if it be indeed the fiend to whom i have sold myself i have no help from perdition if it be man i am scarcely less terribly fettered in either case i will not remain here longer nor will i avail myself of this accursed money which has tempted me to my undoing and hurling the pocket-book to the farther end of the room he was about to pass through the door when a mocking laugh arrested him <laughs> he looked round with astonishment and dread but could see no one after a while he again moved forward but a voice which he recognized as that of rougemont called upon him to stay it will be in vain to fly said the unseen speaker you cannot escape me whether you remain here or not whether you use the wealth i have given you or leave it behind you you cannot annul your bargain with this knowledge you are at liberty to go but remember on the seventh night from this i shall require edith talbot from you where are you fiend demanded oriol gazing around furiously show yourself that i may confront you <laughs> a mocking laugh was the only response deigned to this injunction give me back the compact cried oriol imploringly it was signed in ignorance i knew not the price i was to pay for your assistance wealth is of no value to me without edith without wealth you could not obtain her replied the voice you are only therefore where you were but you will think better of the bargain to-morrow meanwhile i counsel you to place the money you have so unwisely cast from you safely under lock and key and to seek repose you will awaken with very different thoughts in the morning how am i to account for my sudden accession of wealth inquired oriol after a pause <laughs> you a gambler and ask that question returned the unseen stranger with a bitter laugh but i will make your mind easy on that score as regards the house you will find a regular conveyance of it within that writing desk while the note lying on the table which bears your address comes from me and announces the payment of a hundred and twenty thousand pounds to you as a debt of honour you see i have provided against every difficulty and now farewell the voice was then hushed and though oriol addressed several other questions to the unseen speaker no answer was returned him after some moments of irresolution oriol once more took up the pocket-book and deposited it in the writing-desk in which he found as he had been led to expect a deed conveying the house to him he then opened the note lying upon the table and found its contents accorded with what had just been told him placing it with the pocket-book he locked the writing-desk exclaiming it is useless to struggle further i must yield to fate this done he went into the adjoining room and casting his eyes about remarked the antique bottle and flagon the letter was filled to the brim how or with what oriol paused not to examine but seizing the cup with desperation 
he placed it to his lips and emptied it at a draught a species of intoxication but pleasing as that produced by opium presently succeeded all his fears left him and in their place the gentlest and most delicious fancies arose surrendering himself delightedly to their influence he sank upon a couch and for some time was wrapped in a dreamy elysium imagining himself wandering with edith talbot in a lovely garden redolent of sweets and vocal with the melody of birds their path led through a grove in the midst of which was a fountain and they were hastening towards its marble brink when all at once edith uttered a scream and starting back pointed to a large black snake lying before her and upon which she would have trodden the next moment oriol sprang forward and tried to crush the reptile with his heel but avoiding the blow it coiled around his leg and plunged its venom teeth into his flesh the anguish occasioned by the imaginary wound roused him from his slumber and looking up he perceived that a servant was in attendance bowing obsequiously the man inquired whether he had occasion for anything show me to my bedroom that is all i require replied auriol scarcely able to shake off the effect of the vision and getting up he followed the man almost mechanically out of the room end of section 16